And good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Oculus Clinical Webinar Series. I'm really excited about tonight's presentation, Dry Eye Disease, Incorporating IPL in the Oculus Keratograph 5N. And before I introduce my speaker tonight, and just a little bit of housekeeping, if you have any questions, please put the questions in the chat and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can after the presentation. Um, so let me introduce our speaker tonight. I'm really proud to uh, introduce Dr. Rolando Toyos, who received his bachelor's and master's degree from the University of California, Berkeley and Stanford University. He then received his medical degree at the University of Illinois, where he was class president, graduating with the James Scholar Academic Honors. He completed his internship in internal medicine at the Illinois Masonic Hospital in Chicago and completed his ophthalmology residency at Northwest University and Chicago Children's Hospital. Dr. Toyos is board certified in ophthalmology and specializes in cataract surgery, LASIK, glaucoma, and dry eye. He's one of the most experienced surgeons in the country with completing over 35,000 cataract surgeries, 20,000 glaucoma laser treatments, and 25,000 LASIK surgeries. Dr. Toyos is the inventor of the procedure Intense Pulse Light, IPL for dry eye disease, and he's trained hundreds of surgeons, both nationally and internationally on surgical techniques, medications, and new technologies. He's also authored several papers and books. With no further ado, Dr. Toyos, take it away. Hey, thank you for having me. My name is Dr. Toyos uh, from Toyos Clinic. Our clinic started 25 years ago. Uh, we started out with myself and two employees, and now we have clinics in Nashville, New York City, Memphis, and we're doing some dry eye clinics in Australia and helping out some dry eye clinics in Europe. I tell people my specialty is cataract surgery, LASIK surgery, and dry eye. I really didn't start out to be a dry eye specialist, but 25 years ago when I started Toyo's clinic, I had general ophthalmology and I also had an aesthetics clinic. And one of the pieces of equipment that I bought was an intense pulse light uh, system that I was gonna use on rosacea patients to get rid of their rosacea. And 25 years ago, uh, that's what IPL was, uh, uh, known for is getting rid of brown spots, doing photofacials, and helping get rid of telangiectasias in rosacea patients. And I started doing that, and some of my patients started reporting that uh, they had some improvement in their dry eye. And I looked at their lid margin, and there was improvement uh, in this in their lid margin. And then that started me on a whole journey of trying to see if light treatments could be used for dry eye. And then with the advent of social media, patients started hearing about uh, intense pulse light and how I was treating patients uh, with intense pulse light for dry eye. So I started uh, posting and more and more patients came and they were coming from all over. And it just kind of showed me how uh, important and how many patients from all over the world were suffering from this thing, uh, this disease. And when uh, restasis was approved and immediately made a billion dollars, people realized, oh my gosh, this is a bigger problem than we thought. More patients have this uh, than we thought. And my clinic was getting uh, full uh, with dry eye patients. So now we have many clinics, many doctors, uh, my wife, who does oculoplastics joined the practice uh, about 13 years ago uh, and all the doctors are performing intense pulse light uh, for dry eye when i started talking about ipl and low level light treatment for dry eye a lot of people and doctors uh, didn't understand how a light treatment could be used on the skin to help a eye problem so it took many years, so uh, 20 something years from the idea until we finally got FDA approval stating that uh, IPL specifically can be used for dry eye. In those years, uh, I've learned and done so many different things to try to treat uh, dry eye, because as we know, it's such a difficult 
disease to treat that you can't be a one trick pony. So I use IPL, I use low level light treatment. I came up with the use of low dose naltrexone for dry eye, PRP uh, for dry eye. Uh, I wrote a book way back in 2015 called Dry Disease in the Year 2020, kind of talking about not only IPL, but all the different treatments that were coming down the road and that we were using uh, then and now. And then a lot of these treatments did get FDA approval that I talked about. And over time, I've realized, and I've talked more and more about this, the importance of diet and lifestyle in terms of treating dry eye. So I wrote this latest book, Toyo's Dry Eye Diet, and I'm going to get into a little bit of that uh, in this lecture. So I'm excited to, to talk about IPL, but I always try to give listeners and people who attend my lecture uh, a little bit more. So, so we know this is a big disease that it's only growing. An estimated 35 million people in the U.S. suffer from this, but I think it's much more. We have three daughters, two of our daughters had suffered from dry eye starting in their teenage years. I'm seeing this used to be a disease of the 40 year old or older female, but now we're seeing it in teenagers, men, boys, uh, everybody. You'd be really surprised what comes through our dry eye uh, clinic. And a lot of times doctors push back on some of the treatments that we recommend like intense pulse light or low level light treatment because they say you know the patients can't afford uh, these treatments but what i tell them is these patients are already spending thousands of dollars on all of these other treatments that really don't work and if you look at the dry eye market and where it's gone and where it's going it's only increasing and our economy is spending billions and billions of dollars to try to counteract this disease and it's taking away from not only the activities of daily life but the productivity that these uh, patients could have if their dry eye wasn't so bad so we have plenty of patients who have come in and said you know they're not able to work as long as they would like to or they've had to stop their job, uh, declare disability uh, because the the problems that they're having uh, with their dry eye. So it really is affecting the economy and these patients, you know, will pay anything for for any kind of relief. And so what our goal in our clinic is, is to offer them things that we know are working and give them value uh, for those dollars that they're spending instead of coming in with a bag full of drops and other contraptions that really don't work. So one of the things I like to tell people is every doctors is everything that you've been taught in school and read in the textbooks is basically completely wrong. In, dry, in the Toyo's dry eye diet, I actually go through the science of all of these. So you should uh, look at this, but you know, warm compresses actually uh, heat on the epidermis actually only causes dilation of talonjectasias, causing more inflammation. Uh, if you go to a dermatology clinic, none of those doctors are treating rosacea patients or patients with acne or any of these things with heat because it only aggravates the problem. Lid scrubs, most of the things that are used and ingredients used in lid scrubs, like detergents and other things, uh, tea tree oil, are actually toxic to the meibomian glands. So we really don't want to, to do that. And then when you tell patients to do a scrub, they don't gently wipe their lids, but they actually get in there and scrub, which, ha which breaks down the epidermis leaving them more susceptible to infection, demodex, uh, bacterial overgrowth, and inflammation. Medicamentosa, I think, is the number one uh, biggest problem that we're having now is that so many of these patients are turning to artificial tears, 
they're recommended artificial tears by their doctor. So essentially they're going and they go to the pharmacy, they get whatever artificial tear they find that is inexpensive. They've been told by a doctor that artificial tears are okay. But a lot of these artificial tears contain chemicals that are actually harmful to the ocular surface like boric acid or BAK. And also what these tears are doing is they're washing away the natural tear, which contains over 2000 molecules that actually help keep homeostasis of the ocular surface. Doxycycline was very, and still is very common to give the dry eye patient, thinking that the anti-inflammatory effects of the doxycycline uh, will improve the meibomian gland uh, dysfunction and improve the skin. The problem with doxycycline is we now know, and science has shown this, is that the doxycycline actually kills good gut bacteria. And when you lose your good gut bacteria and you have an acidic gut, that causes actually more inflammation. So you win a short-term battle, but you actually lose the war. I've had patients that have come in who have been on doxycycline for over a decade. And then they wonder why they're having problems not only with dry eye, but they're having problems with overall uh, inter uh, overall uh, inflammation. Uh, most doctors, when they see a dry eye patient, if they have mild dry eye, they really don't recommend anything. They don't recommend any kind of medical intervention. And what we now know is that mild dry eye and inflammation turns to moderate dry eye, which turns into severe. So if you don't control this inflammation, if you don't control the downward spiral of the meibomian gland function, it only gets worse. So if you see it, you've got to do something about it. Um, and, you know, we were not, this wasn't even an inflammatory disease uh, back in our textbooks. Uh, it wasn't even a disease, it was actually a syndrome when I was going through uh, residency and uh, learning about, about this. And it was only like a one page thing, a one page uh, explanation in our textbooks. But now we know that this is an inflammatory disease uh, that can only uh, get worse. There's plenty of uh, definitions of dry eye disease. You've got TFOS, you've got uh, the European Dry Eye Society, you've got the Asian Dry Eye Society. Uh, I'm going to give you my working definition. You know, I I don't think saying that this is a, a multifactorial disease really kind of uh, helps you kind of put in context what this disease is about and how you're going to treat it. So this is my working definition, and it comes from all my work with IPL and low-level light treatment. This is a skin gland problem affecting the glands that make up our normal tear, and instead of once you've affected those glands, instead of making a normal tear, you make an inflammatory tear, which actually can uh, affect the ocular surface and destroy the cells of the ocular surface. It could be an isolated problem just with the glands of uh, the lid margin and the lacrimal gland, but it could uh, be a manifestation of an overall systemic inflammation, kind of like a Sjogren's we know that Sjogren's patients, rheumatoid arthritis patients, lupus patients have more of a risk factor for dry eye, acne patients, rosacea patients. So uh, this could be a larger problem that is just uh, affecting the patient in their eye, but it could be a larger problem that we have to look at. Once you have breakdown of the ocular surface, it can affect the vision, the nerves, and all the ocular structures. One of the biggest things that we're seeing more of now is conjugalasis. Now that we have confocal microscopy, we're seeing how a bad tear can affect the corneal nerves and why so many of these patients have pain. If you delay treatment, what happens is the disease gets worse and the ocular surfaces get worse, the nerves get worse. It affects the activities of daily life, which start to lead to a psychological uh, problem in these patients, and that's why you have so many patients uh, who are depressed, uh, have psychological impairment from this disease. If you just think about it, 
if every time you blink, you're feeling your eyes and the dryness of your eyes or pain, uh, could be a, a huge problem. And instead of a multifactorial disease, I think uh, the better uh, term to use is that we're going to have a treatment that is multi-pronged, that we're actually going to treat the skin and treat the glands and treat systemically and uh, go after uh, the diet and do all these things to try to help these patients. A um, lot of risk factors. We know about uh, age and uh, gender. You know that as a patient gets older, their basal tear secretion decreases. It happens more in women than it does in men. We know the medical conditions are uh, tied hand in hand with uh, these with dry eye. Uh, plenty of the medications that patients are using are connected uh, to uh, dry eye. Uh, one of the ones that you probably don't know about other than the statins and aspirin and birth control pills and antipsychotics and all that is uh, a lot of these uh, female patients who are older uh, are using anticholinesterase, um, anticholinergic medications to uh, control incontinence, uh, but those cause severe dry eye. So we got plenty of female patients who have been uh, put on these uh, uh, drugs and immediately are suffering from severe uh, dry eye. We know surgeries like LASIK and cataract surgery can cause uh, dry eye. Uh, I actually have been a LASIK surgeon since a, uh, for 28 years. I've actually switched from LASIK to smile because I've seen on confocal that patients with smile have less effect on their nerve and less uh, dry eye post uh, procedure. And I do believe that any of these patients having any kind of surgery, whether it's LASIK or cataract surgery, if they have mild, moderate, or severe dry eye, you better treat that dry eye before you do any kind of surgery. 70% um, of our dry eye patients have allergies, so you better learn what you're going to do for the seasonal uh, and uh, all year out, all year round allergies that these patients have. Our work environment plays a role. Uh, one of the things that I got into when I started uh, building clinics was learning more about a wellness building uh, movement, which is creating atmospheres where people work that are healthier for them and uh, creating less dry eye in the work environment by creating these uh, wellness, uh, by going through the guidelines of a wellness building and trying to follow those guidelines so that we have less sickness in our workplace. But we know lifestyle becomes very important. I'm standing, sitting here doing this lecture, staring at a screen, you're staring at a screen. That's going to affect uh, the blink rate. That's going to affect the dryness of our eye. And if you already have a pre-existing dry eye, it's going to make it worse. So I really believe if you're going to get into the dry eye space, you've got to have a good knowledge of dermatology and aesthetics and the eye, immunology, neurology, psychology, pharmacology, biotech, diet, wellness. I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot here. I think it's its own subspecialty. Uh, the object of medical care should not be the disease, but the person who should be treated as a whole and not as an organ which the disorder appears. And we, as eye doctors, tend to do that. We go straight to the eye and don't think about the overall patient, about their diet, their wellness, their work environment, uh, their their play, their uh, ev everything uh, comes into, into it when we're treating these uh, dry eye patients. So the workup, uh, I like using a dry eye score. I've used OSDI uh, speed score for a lot of the research projects we do. Uh, I use uh, these, but the dry eye score is being used more and more it actually correlates very well with a speed and OSDI. 
And there's two dry scores you can use. One is telling the, asking the patient on a scale of zero to 100, um, how dry uh, is your eye? 100 being uh, dr the maximum dryness. Uh, and then you could ask them a subsequent question is uh, how often are you experiencing these uh, dry eye uh, problems? Is it zero? which is none of the time, or 100, which is uh, all the time. And this is going to be on an analog scale. They'll, they'll uh, slash a little line on a 0, 100. And uh, this dry eye score is something that we use uh, in our clinic in the day-to-day -to, -day to determine how bad patients' dry eyes are. I like to take time to listen to a patient's dry eye story. It seems like every patient has one and they all can uh, tell you about the time when it just became unbearable. And this is a very cathartic for them to uh, relieve themselves of this, of this story and tell you about it. And it, I think it is part of the healing process. And they'll tell you what they've tried and what works and doesn't, and we take that all into account. And then I talk to the patients about goals, like where what what do we want to do? You know, some patients, their goal is to get back to work. Some patients' goal is to get rid of their redness. Some go, patients, they just don't want to be in pain anymore. Uh, some patients uh, have really bad problems that don't allow them to sleep, so they want to sleep. Some patients want to get rid of all of these medicines. So you really have to talk to the patient to find out exactly uh, what they want and what they're uh, aiming for before you start treating. I always talk to them about diet and lifestyle. I wanna know uh, what type of work they're doing, what they're eating, and try to get them on a Toyo's dry diet. In that book, I have a two month starter diet, which is very restrictive, but actually builds up good bacteria. Uh, I also uh, will stop medications that I know are connected to destroying good gut bacteria like a doxycycline. And then I do, I have the tech do an Oculus care to graph. I look at the myography, the um, non-invasive tear breakup time, and I also uh, look at their tear meniscus. Those are, you, there's plenty of things that the Oculus care graph does. Also looking at redness. I look at all of those things and it's good to have something like the care to graph so that while you're not seeing the patient, the technician is helping you gather all this information so you can spend more time with the patient talking to them about their problem and how you're going to treat it. For advanced testing, we have the confocal microscopy. Uh, one of the things I can tell you, and I'm working on some, some papers, is that even mild patients have abnormalities seen on confocal microscopy when you look at nerves. It's really told. It's really showed me that we need to treat these patients early and often because even mild dry eye is affecting the ocular surface and the nerves of the ocular surface. Looking at the patient, you know, sometimes you can walk in a room and see the patient has acne or rosacea. So you know, once you see that, that the patient uh, probably has dry eye. Then get to the slit lamp. I think that is the you know, best way to determine dry eyes, looking at the meibomian glands, squeezing on the glands, looking at what comes out, looking at the tear film, looking at tear breakup time. You can do some lysamine to see if there's any disruption of uh, the cells of the ocular surface. Uh, and then after you get all of this information, what is your game plan? So I think uh, what I've noticed from patients that are coming to me from other doctors is that there's no game plan, uh, that you're just throwing darts on a board and hoping something will stick. So you really have to have in your mind uh, how you treat these patients, what is your game plan, uh, how you're gonna tailor that game plan to this patient and go through a kind of a step-by-step -step way of treating these patients. Don't do the kitchen sink method where you throw 800 things at them. So I don't, uh, and these patients, I don't give them IPL and PRP right out of the bat. I'll start with some IPL. 
I don't start out with three medicines. I may just start out with one. Uh, I may start out with low-dose naltrexone and, and IPL, or I may start out with Sequa and IPL, or I may start out with Tervaya and IPL. We've got all sorts of ways, depending on what I'm seeing in the patient, of treating these patients, but it's, it's a game plan. I uh, see all of the information and say, this is, we're going to get you from point A to point B, and this is how we're going to do it. And if, if we're getting to this road and we're not getting to the point where we want to be, then we can always add this. And if that's not working to satisfaction, then we can do this or this. So have a game plan. Dry assessment with keratograph. I look at tear foam quantity. That you know, I'm, I've done a lot looking at tear meniscus uh, for these patients. I'll tell you about a study that that we just completed. Tear film quality, my Bohmian gland assessment, damage to the corneal surface, and redness. So look at the skin. You know, you walk in, you see the patient sitting at the chair. You can make a lot of determination. You know, 80% of these patients that have rosacea are dry eye patients. Uh, patients who have acne, high correlation with meibomian gland dysfunction in dry eye. A lot of sun damage, you know they're gonna have a higher rate of meibomian gland uh, dysfunction. So you can do all of this before you even get to the slit lamp, so take your time. And then the keratograph 5M and the dry eye analysis. So we did a study for Tervaya looking at tear meniscus. And what we did is we took these patients, looked at their tear meniscus, gave them some Tervaya, and looked at how we increased uh, the tear meniscus. So this could give you a lot of information. So if you're questioning whether a patient has Sjogren's or not, you could look at the tear meniscus uh, to see if it's abnormal. Normal is between 0.35 and 0.26, and then it goes uh, from there. So in this tear meniscus study that we did with Tervaya, we had the patients uh, do some uh, nasal spray of Tervaya, and then we looked at the tear meniscus over a five-minute time period uh, with the oculus. We're doing this and looking at other things to see how other treatments uh, immediately affect the tear meniscus, like IPL. The non-invasive tear breakup time, this saves you a lot of time. You can, I tell people it's usually two seconds uh, lower than normal tear breakup time. Uh, so if you read a four seconds on non-invasive tear breakup time, it's usually going to be about six seconds. Uh, these things are, the non-invasive tear breakup time is so sensitive that it will record that spot, uh, the first spot it sees. And most of the time, how we record tear breakup time as clinicians is we see a spot and then look for that spot to expand out. You can look at tear film dynamic and you can look at lipid layer looking at the rings and looking at the bifringence of the tear film. Uh, when you're looking at the lipid layer. Uh, conjunctival redness, for a lot of patients, this is kind of the number one thing uh, that they come in wanting to correct is that uh, the redness because of the inflammation is uh, so bad. So this is a way to document uh, that redness and with treatment, see how you've improved the redness over time. So here's the grading scale and you can have a picture of the patient uh, and what grade they have of their redness, do the treatment, and then see how much you improve that. Confocal, this is gonna be huge. I, I really think that uh, the confocal, it, we've had it for over a year, and uh, we're discovering more and more. I plan on uh, publishing a lot of different things that we've been looking at uh, utilizing uh, confocal. So you better get yourself acquainted with this because a lot of patients are complaining of uh, neurotrophic keratitis due to their dry eye. And there's ways of testing that, but the best way to see how bad their NK is, is with confocal and seeing how much you can improve their NK uh, 
by uh, whatever treatment you have, either an observate or PRP, and then following that with confocal. So we've had patients who have had uh, just terrible confocals in terms of the nerve pathology. We've put them on observate or PRP, and we've shown uh, growth nerves and improvement of nerves uh, on the con. This is just a little video kind of showing all the stuff that we can see. We can see their endothelial cells, their stroma, their epithelial cells, and uh, their nerves. And you can get a lot of information on inflammation of the cornea or any kind of destruction of uh, corneal nerves or corneal dropout. IPL, so I told you this started way back in uh, 2000 for me. This is the first case report that we uh, put out there in 2001 and was published by iWorld and taken up by iWorld in 2003. And uh, from this, I got a grant from Ascaris to look at the relation of IPL helping uh, dry eye patients. And it all started with these kind of rosacea patients. They would come in, they'd have telangiectasias of the skin, and we'd want to improve that, so we would do IPL. We found improvement of their skin with uh, some photo uh, rejuvenation of the skin, decreasing the telangiectasias, but it was also improving the meibomian gland. So we figured out, uh, I figured out a way to use that. I actually have patents on selective wavelengths of light to um, help prevention and treatment of dry eye uh, disease. Uh, picking those rosacea patients was a perfect uh, group of patients to kind of show what we were trying to do with dry eye because these patients, not only do they have telangiectasias going to the meibomian glands and secreting inflammatory mediators, but they actually have inflammatory mediators right on their skin. The number one inflammatory mediator, most specific inflammatory mediator for dry patients on their tear is interleukin-17. Interleukin-17 is made by T cells. Uh, T, helper, uh, T cells make T helper cells. T helper cells make interleukin-17. So that's why all these medications like lefitogras and cyclosporin that our T cell immunomodulators work for dry eye because they're decreasing the amount of interleukin 17. Showing here, we showed that IPL actually, uh, IPL has been shown to decrease interleukin 17 on the skin, but it's also been shown in our study that we can decrease the amount of interleukin 17 on the tear when doing IPL on these patients. So what is IPL? So IPL isn't a laser, it's actually a xenon flash lamp. If you can remember back to your days of chemistry, uh, all the way to the left of the periodic table are the noble gases, the stable gases. They have the right amount of electrons in the outer shell. They're so stable that if you put electricity through them, uh, they become unstable, and when they're unstable, they release uh, wavelengths of light that go anywhere from 500 or 400 nanometers all the way to 1,000 nanometers, and then go back into stability. So we want to take advantage of those wavelengths of light that it's uh, putting out there. So we actually found in the studies that I did uh, looking at low-level light treatment in IPL is that the wavelength of 600 to 700 are the wavelengths that actually photobiomodulate the cells of the meibomian gland. So we put a filter that blocks out all those wavelengths below 600, releasing the red, the wavelengths of light in the red range. Uh, and those wavelengths of light do several things, which I'll show you here in a second. And then one of the early things I realized is that uh, these Let's go back here. That all this energy in the initial IPLs that we had, that was a lot of energy to give. And what we realize is that the closer you get to the lid margin, 
the more efficacious your treatment with IPL is. So we want to get as close to the lid margin as possible. The problem is that the lid margin is the thinnest skin of the whole body. So you can't give all of that energy all at once. So what you have to do is pulse that energy so that you have some thermal relaxation time in between the pulses. Because what happens when you treat these patients in one area, you get a wave of energy that's dissipating uh, dis uh, from that one area out. So what you wanna do is between the pulses, give some time for that energy wave uh, to go ahead and filter uh, out to the other areas of the skin so that you're not giving all this energy all at once. So that's where we came up with pulses of energy around the lid margin so that you can actually treat the lid margin without having any kind of complications. So one of the first mechanisms of action that we saw with IPL is that this red light is absorbed by oxyhemoglobin in these telangiectetic cells in the dermis. And when it does absorb this wavelength of light, it creates heat and actually that heat coagulates those telangiectasias. So one of the mechanisms of action is closing off telangiectasias with IPL. Another mechanism of action is that we know that intense pulse light can actually kill microorganisms. Uh, we are using intense pulse light to disinfect hospitals and disinfect rooms. This is the Xenex IPL robot that shoots out IPL throughout a room. And these wavelengths uh, can actually kill microorganisms and clean a room instead of going and doing hand uh, cleaning uh, with a bunch of chemicals. So when we do IPL around the lid margin, we are decreasing the bacterial load. Demodex is really hard to kill. They dive into the pores of our skin and the follicles. So we have to, IPL will kill um, some Demodex, uh, but I find that uh, we need more than in some patients uh, than just IPL. It turns out that rosacea patients have 20 times the amount of Demodex than your normal patient population. For those patients that the IPL is not the only thing that we need to kill um, the Demodex, we actually use Ivermectin plus skin and face. Ivermectin is the most effective killer of Demodex that we have, and putting it on the skin with some melatonin actually draws out the Demodex so that we can kill them. So I've been working with uh, Dr. Chen in, uh, out in Shanghai where he can actually keep Demodex alive uh, for 24 to 48 hours, and we looked at IPL and how IPL can stop these Demodex uh, in their track. But as I said before, some of these Demodex aren't wide, out in the wide open. Uh, they are buried deep down in pores of the skin and face and lid margin and hair follicles. So sometimes you need a little bit more. The number one reason I'm asked, what is the number one reason why IPL works uh, to uh, improve my bony and gland dysfunction is that IPL, uh, these wavelengths of light actually stimulate the mitochondria to work better. So um, we call that process of using light to stimulate mitochondria photobiomodulation. Uh, so I think that is the number one reason why IPL works so well and why low level light works. Uh, in terms of my bone gland dysfunction and improving cells. Photobiomodulation is used in many areas of medicine. We're actually using infrared uh, to improve the retina in age-related macular degeneration patients. We're using it in aesthetics. So when you see somebody putting on a mask or using a lamp uh, with low-level light treatment, that is actually improving things uh, superficially at the epidermis. But really, if 
if you did IPL an inch from the skin or you do low level light right uh, um, not on the skin, you're only stimulating epidermal cells. So fibroblasts to make uh, elastin and collagen. Really low level light needs to be on the skin and I'll get into low level light a little bit later in this lecture. Orthopedics infrared is being used. If Aaron Rodgers wants to heal that Achilles quicker, he should be doing about eight hours of infrared right after his surgery. I actually uh, tore my Achilles playing basketball and that's what I did. Uh, I did infrared uh, eight hours a day. I was actually walking two weeks after my Achilles surgery and actually back on the court within several weeks uh, after my Achilles surgery. Uh, so that area of the uh, of the Achilles is very low blood flow. That infrared photobiomodulates the cells around there, but also brings more blood flow, uh, which speeds up the healing process. And now we know that IPL does photobiomodulation because it stimulates the cells. Why do we know that? Is that we have plenty of patients that have meibomian gland dropout and they've tried everything to get those glands back. The only thing that I've seen to actually bring glands back is actually intense pulse light and low level uh, light treatment. I'm showing you this picture here. This is somebody that had um, came to me right after they had probing. These black spots that you see here, these are blood clots where the uh, probing went and transected, transected, these glands that have this abnormal anatomy. So you really have to be careful when you're talking about uh, probing. I'm not a, I'm not a believer in probing for uh, dry eye and none of the studies really back probing uh, for dry eye. But if you are probing, be careful. If you've got patients with abnormal mybography, when you come in there uh, with your probe, you could be transecting these glands. So it shows you another good reason why you should be doing mybography in these patients. And then uh, this is, it sh this shouldn't be controversial, but you should express after every IPL, 99% of the studies are with IPL with expression. I'm only aware of uh, one uh, study. Uh, the FDA study was IPL with expression. Uh, this lets you know uh, what kind of secretions these patients are making so that you can document. So this would be toothpaste-like secretions, which would be severe meibomian gland dysfunction. But right after IPL, you've opened up those glands. These wavelengths of light have penetrated the epidermis to go to uh, the dermis and actually uh, melt those secretions. So it's uh, better than a warm compress where you're trying to get heat to the epidermis and hope the heat gets to the dermis. These wavelengths of light penetrate the epidermis, go to the dermal layer, open up the gland, uh, and actually uh, melt these secretions so that you can uh, express. So this is more of a butter-like secretion. So this would be more like moderate meibomian gland uh, secretion where instead of a white toothpaste like secretion, you're getting more of a butter hard or soft butter coming out of these glands only way you're going to know that is with meibomian gland expression so express after every ipl session then on the lid margin what should you expect to see so patients with these talangiectasias after they get ipl what you're going to see is the lid margin is uh, less erythematous uh, you'll start to get eyelashes growing again so here you see after two IPL sessions in this young patient, we get closure of the talangiectasias and we get uh, growth of the eyelashes back. You have less erythema of the uh, lid margin. So the mechanism of action, it kills bacteria and demodex. The heat and expression get that thick secretion out of the glands so that the glands can function uh, better. You close off the abnormal talangiectasias. You decrease inflammatory mediators on the skin, and then photobiomodulation. And uh, 
This is the study, the plus one study uh, that I led to get uh, FDA approval of IPL for dry eye. One other thing, and it's less studied, is that uh, any type of heat generated in the skin and in the dermis, if it doesn't destroy the cells, it actually will stimulate heat shock proteins that will actually help the DNA of cells work better. So you're getting photobiomodulation of the cells at the mitochondrial level, and then at the DNA level, you're getting heat shock proteins that are making uh, the meibomian glands uh, work better. So the FDA study, we did actually patients who either got a sham light treatment with expression versus IPL with expression. Uh, we used the Toyo's protocol. Uh, there was uh, one group that uh, tried using uh, another uh, popular unstudied protocol and the results were so bad that we had to uh, scrap and start the study over getting doctors to use the Toyo's protocol. So beware of unstudied protocols that are pushed uh, by people. If somebody has a protocol that they think works better, my advice to them is actually publish a study uh, and let's see what the results are. So we had two groups, 43 with sham, 45 with IPL. Fitzpatrick one to four. And here we see that the IPL was statistically significant in terms of increase in tear breakup time. But you do notice that just getting patients expressed does show some improvement uh, in their tear breakup time. So express, express, express. OSDI, statistically significant decrease in OSDI, but even expressing uh, shows you, without IPL, shows you some improvement in OSDI score. But this is the uh, piece of information that we learned that is the most important is getting glands that don't work to work again. This is the photobiomodulation part where IPL actually gets glands that aren't working to start working, and this is for upper and lower lid. There was an upper lid tr uh, treatment in the FDA study, but we did a study looking at upper lid, and if we just did upper lid IPL, what does that do? And upper lid actually uh, IPL with expression does improve my bomian gland dysfunction uh, signs and symptoms. Here's an important point. External shields, you don't need internal shields. These wavelengths of light do not penetrate past uh, the dermis. Uh, putting internal shields, what we're finding in confocal, and again, we'll be publishing these results, is internal shields actually disrupt uh, the cornea, the corneal nerves, and can cause more damage, uh, and it doesn't give you any extra protection. Now, people say, oh, I see the light. We have receptors that actually perceive light, so if you closed your eyes, turned off the lights in your room, and then turned on the lights, your retinas would perceive that light with your eyes closed. Doesn't mean that these wavelengths of light are penetrating down uh, into the eye and causing any problems. The only time that there's been problems with IPL is if you were to flash some a patient or flash someone with IPL with their eye wide open. There's never been any retina complications from that. There's been studies showing that it can cause inflammation in the anterior chamber, iritis, and maybe transillumination defects. So you want the eyes covered with external shields. Uh, and you can use these light treatments on the uh, skin so that these wavelengths of light can go to the meibomian glands, but they don't uh, bypass uh, the dermis. So the Toyo's protocol, this is something that uh, I experimented with one pass, two pass, three, and four pass. The best was a two pass method. I experimented trachis to trachis, full face, and just lid. 
and it turned out that trachis to trachis and full face uh, worked the best. Uh, so this is the protocol that uh, I developed. If you want to do full face, again, that can lead to more adverse events, so you have to be very careful. But the protocol for dry eye is ear to ear through the nose. Now, the, um, uh, I'm always asked, well, why are we doing the nose and why are we doing trachis to trachis? What's the theory behind that? Turns out that these talonjectasias not only just come up like this, but they actually come from the trachis and they come from the nose over. So what you're doing when you're doing IPL from trachis to trachis is you're decreasing the amount of inflammatory mediators to that are going to the meibomian glands and uh, the lid margin. I've already talked about external shields versus internal shields. You just want eyes closed and you want the eyelashes protected. The reason being is that IPL used to be a treatment for uh, uh, excess hair. It's a great way to, not a great way, it's a okay way of hair removal. So that's why you want to protect the eyelashes. So that's why you're using the external shields to protect those uh, eyelashes. As a hair removal treatment, it's a little painful and that's why people don't actually use IPL for hair removal anymore. The treatments are two to four weeks apart. I tend to go two weeks since we have better and better technology for IPL. Uh, you can't use one set of parameters and use it for a different IPL system. Each IPL system has their uh, unique function and quality, so you have to develop protocols for each IPL system. IPL was not performed in the FDA study for upper lids. All the upper lid work is from that paper that I that I published that I showed you earlier. Um, variations on the TOYO's protocol need to be studied uh, and published before you adopt them. I think one of the number one uh, patients that we're seeing now from other doctors is patients that have had IPL, but they've had a completely different protocol than uh, what was demonstrated on the FDA study uh, or in any of the other papers and the efficacy is very low. And then we do IPL using the TOYOS protocol and these patients do much better. And again, trachis to trachis, upper lid and lower lid. Other aesthetics procedures. So I get this question all the time. So we've been, we have a full aesthetics clinic. So we do RF and um, we do microneedling and RF microneedling and low level light treatment and fractionated CO2 laser and erbium laser and Botox and filler. Again, this is a skin gland condition. So if you can do anything to improve the skin, whether it's a fractionated CO2 laser or, or RF, you're going to get some improvement. But what we've found in studies is IPL is way up here in terms of stimulating the meibomian glands to work better. Low level light treatment is below that. And then everything else that improves the skin, whether it's RF, CO2 laser, helps, uh, but it's incremental help and not, it can't compare to what you see using light treatments to stimulate uh, meibomian glands. So IPL is the gold standard. L, low level light treatment is good for home maintenance. And in patients that can't have IPL, like a Fitzpatrick type six, you can do low level light treatment in office with expression. So we have plenty of patients that um, not only get IPL, but sometimes come in and get actually low level light treatment with expression or patients that can have IPL, they come in for low level light treatment. But where we're using low level light treatment the most is with our at home low level light treatment uh, um, technology, which we call the Q. And the Q I've been studying now for over 18 years. This, this is one uh, Q that I made. Uh, this is the first Q that I used 
uh, in research. It's a Q, uh, low-level light treatment that I made uh, in my garage, and we've kind of stepped up from there all the way from looking at blue light and infrared light and red light and how that helps patients with uh, dry eye disease. This was the first cue, which was a blue light cue, and this is one of the first cues, which was a red light cue, and now we have the cue that you see in this picture here, which if you want to learn more about any of these things, including the cue and how you can utilize the cue in your office and get it to your patients, you can come to our TAD conference. We have one in October in Nashville and one during Vision Expo East in New York. So thanks for giving me the time. I'm gonna stick around for some questions. The best way to get a hold of me if you have any uh, um, in-depth uh, questions or you just wanna ask me about some things, texting is the best way to get a hold of me, 731-234-1400. Uh, also, we have a lot of, if you can't make it to a TAD conference, we have doctors that either come to our Nashville clinic or our New York clinic and spend the day with us uh, seeing what we do in our clinic for our dry eye patients. I have a Saturday dry eye clinic uh, in New York City. That seems to be the most popular one for doctors to come shadow me. Um, that is it. I appreciate Oculus giving me the time to let me talk dry eye. I love talking about it uh, and love talking about IPL. Thank you so much, Rolanda. What a great presentation. Um, it, it shows we have more questions today than I think any presentation in a long time. Um, in fact, the good news is you've answered almost all the questions that have been asked, more than 20 questions. But there's a few here that we can probably clarify a little bit and some very basic questions. Um, the first question I have for you is what's the darkest skin color that you can treat with IPL? I know you talked about the Fitzpatrick scale, but can you talk a little bit about uh, the limitations of IPL, or if there are limitations, what are your limitations? So you have to remember that IPL, these wavelengths of light will be absorbed by melanin uh, and the melanocyte. So you have to be very careful when you're talking about uh, darker complexions past Fitzpatrick type four, five, and six. Uh, when we initially started doing IPL and those first studies, it was Fitzpatrick type one and two. It wasn't until the technology got better and we could use pulses and um, uh, work with energy levels and thermal relaxation time that we could start doing stuff with darker skin. Now, I treat Fitzpatrick type five and six, but I would say get experience doing uh, IPL and learning how the skin reacts with IPL before you start getting into the darker skin types. And then this is another good reason why going trachis to trachis is always great because if you uh, treat here first and you make a mistake on energy level and you burn the patient, that skin area will recover quickly. If you do something and pick the wrong energy level around the lid margin where that skin is thin, uh, then you can get into trouble and some long lasting uh, problems. The way I've been able to treat uh, darker skin types is lowering the energy and increasing thermal relaxation time, meaning that when they get that pulse of energy, there's some time for that heat to dissipate uh, throughout the skin uh, before the next uh, pulse of energy comes. So, um, uh, but each IPL system is different. So you can't take the parameters from one IPL system and then plug them into another IPL system. Uh, we have several IPL systems in our clinic, and I can tell you that they all generate different energies. Uh, they all have their quirks about them. So make sure when you do get an IPL system that you have a protocol uh, that is tested and that they have some studies for. Rolando, you mentioned um, about uh, multiple sessions, maybe two to four weeks apart, maybe three to four sessions. Um, how often do patients not respond at all to IPL? And if they don't, how do you prepare them before you even start treating of what to expect? 
So what I find is the older the patient and the more severe their meibomian gland dysfunction, the more IPLs you'll have to do back-to-back. Uh, uh, -back. So young patients with these wavelengths of light respond very quickly. Older patients may take uh, more time. But what I always do is I do the four treatments and then I give the patient a month off. What I want to see is how their glands respond uh, to the energy. So one of the things that I'm seeing is, uh, with new people, new doctors starting out with IPL, is they'll just keep giving patient IPL, IPL, IPL without giving them a rest. And what these cells are, what you have to think is these cells are absorbing energy and you have to let that energy start to work on the mitochondria before you shock the system again. That's why you should always keep in mind that just because a little energy works great doesn't mean more energy works better. So some people think, oh, I'm going to give them, this is an older patient with severe, I'm going to give them 18 joules of energy. And it actually works the exact opposite. There is a sweet spot in terms of how much energy these meibomian glands can take. And you don't want to give too much and you don't want to give too often. So give these patients a little bit of a break after you've given them the four treatments. Uh, we always looked at, this is, you know, 10 years of work before. So look, going from like 2001 to 2010, where we were looking at what was the sweet spot and the four treatment protocol uh, was the sweet spot for most patients. But again, you may have some patients that are going to need more. So an 80-year-old with severe meibomian gland dysfunction, that's never had any kind of treatment whatsoever, uh, severe rosacea, they may need more treatments. Excellent. Um, a question about chalasia. Do you, do you treat chalasia with IPL? And if so, what's your protocol? Yeah, so what I would do is whatever energy level you would normally treat uh, for that area, and you're going to do a two-pass uh, protocol. So say they have lower lid and your protocol for their skin type is 14 joules. Hit them with 14 joules, and then you're going to try to do some gentle expression, whatever they can take, because what you're trying to do is uh, get the flow going up instead of the flow going down. Uh, with that IPL, you've opened up the opening of the gland so that you can do some gentle expression. Go ahead and express, and then treat them with a steroid antibiotic. And depending on what the patient has going on. So for example, we had a patient that had a wedding on Saturday, had a hordeolum. We treated on Monday. I had her come back on Wednesday and I treated her again. And by Friday with the two treatments of IPL and uh, with steroid antibiotic, uh, it was gone. So now if they don't have some kind of event that they can go to, you can wait a week and then bring them back one week after you've done the IPL with expression and then um, uh, treat them again and then give them the steroid antibiotic. One thing that I like to point out is a lot of times uh, when they have these hordeolums, it's not a new hordeolum. What happens is it's an old chalazion that has scarred. And that old chalazion that's scarred now is pushing on the other glands by that old gland that has scarred down and they get blocked very easily. So the reason, other reason why you're doing expression is because it could be adjacent glands that are actually blocking and not so much one gland that's blocking. So by actually doing that IPL and doing some expression, you're actually getting those glands to express and it's another quick way to treat uh, hordeolum that you may think is a, is a poison. Now, an old chalazion that's scarred down, that's been there for a year and scarred down, and they want you to get rid of that scar, IPL is not going to be able to do much with that. Gotcha. Can you can you share your thoughts a little bit on um, oral supplements like omega-3s or GLA and um, also on um, blefex and marginal car uh, removing keratosis from the lid margins? Do you have, find value in, in those things? So one of the problems with any kind of scrub or blefex or any of that, you're actually disrupting the uh, tight junctions of the epidermis. So you're actually leaving the patient more vulnerable to bacteria and uh, to demodex. So 
again, you've got to be a little bit of a dermatologist here. If you were to tell a dermatologist this is the way you're treating the lid margin by scrubbing it or blepexing it, uh, they would be shaking their head and that they'd say that's no way to treat the epidermis. Uh, this whole keratitis uh, thing, I'm not a big believer in it because I think once you do IPL, uh, you actually uh, open up those glands and do some expression. I don't see any of this uh, keratitis. Now, if you have a scar down gland, which is very few, most of these glands are dormant because they haven't been working for quite a while. Once you give them three or four IPLs, the glands come back. So that was the most amazing thing. In, all the studies that we've done looking at my biography is that and expressibility and glands coming back IPL actually can bring uh, glands back so I would be treating the skin and the lid margin just like a dermatologist treats the skin and I wouldn't be doing any kind of harsh scrubbing with detergents or tea tree oil or or any of that stuff there's better ways to treat the epidermis and there's better ways to get the glands open and working. <clears throat> Regarding the oral supplements, what's your feeling on the omegas? Yeah. So in the dry eye diet, I actually go over the supplements that I, that there's actually studies showing that it will decrease inflammation, uh, that it'll get the body working uh, better. One of the things that I've been talking about lately is if we're trying to stimulate the mitochondria to work better with IPL and low-level light treatment, one of the problems in that older population is the uh, precursor to uh, energy for the mitochondria, NAD, decreases as you get older. So I really believe NAD is a great supplement, uh, especially in our older patients, to go with uh, IPL. And then there's a whole bunch of other ones that I talk about in the book. So uh, our CoQ10 decreases as we get older. So that's another one to supplement in the older pa patient population that you're trying to get the glands uh, working better. Uh, uh, green tea, uh, all these things that stimulate sirtuins, which are the genes in our body that keep us healthy and uh, keep our cells working better. Anything to stimulate sirtuins, the sirtuin genes like resveratrol, um, uh, quercetin, uh, all of these things. So there's about seven that I currently recommend, and I have about two or three that I'm just waiting for more studies uh, to recommend. But uh, an omega-3, the most studied, uh, and this is going against uh, Penny's dream study, but she compared um, uh, fish oil to olive oil, which olive oil actually is a good uh, uh, a good uh, thing to eat to supplement uh, your meibomian glands to work better. But uh, omega three is the most studied NIH by the NIH supplement that there is, and the benefits completely uh, the the incredible benefits of taking an omega three. Uh, have been documented. So I tell people, take your omega-3. It's going to help your not only your meibomian glands, but and there's plenty of studies showing that the omega-3 does help uh, your meibomian glands. Um, so take your omega-3. Resveratrol. You don't have to drink red wine to get your resveratrol. OQ10, uh, NAD, um, and you know our basic diet is lacking in a lot of vegetables. So I tell patients to, they can do a drink mix that is a veg, vegetable and fruit drink mix to get more of these nutrients uh, to our eyes. It's just, I think diet is the number one and then supplements is number two. So I have one more question before we close out for tonight. You mentioned about how IPL and other treatments can revitalize the functionality of the meibomian glands. Is that something you only see upon expression or is it visible with my bomography also? Yeah, through uh, my, biography, but you, my biography, but you'll have to wait about six to nine months. Um, one thing that the confocal is showing is that uh, within six, six weeks to eight weeks, you can see changes in uh, confocal microscopy. 
it takes about six months to nine months to actually see big changes in my biography. So uh, don't disappoint your patients by telling them after the four treatments of IPL, we're going to do another my biography because you'll you'll be dissatisfied and the patients will be dissatisfied. These glands didn't shut down overnight and they're not going to come back overnight. It takes actually a good secretion and and time uh, for those glands to for the morphology of the gland to change. So uh, don't don't expect big changes like right away. Well, Dr. Toyos, thank you so much for sharing all your knowledge with us tonight. What, what an amazing uh, gift this is for all of us uh, learning about dry eye. Um, any other questions that we didn't get to, we will answer via email. I want to thank everyone for uh, attending tonight. And this recording will be available within next week uh, to listen back to if you wish. Thanks again, Dr. Toyos, for the great presentation. And have a great evening. Thanks, everybody.